so uh, yeah, as Dan said, I'm I'm Jafe. You can find me at Jafe on Twitter. Uh, don't tweet me right now. I won't reply. Um, so uh, I I want to talk about a solid development workflow. Um, I've chosen to use Chassis, and so I want to explain sort of how I got there. So the problem with development environments is you kind of you need one, and so you you don't kind of go out going, hey, I want to look for a development environment. You have a project, and then you go, well, I need a development environment so I can make my project. Um, and then over time, you gradually make it better and better. And so I'm hoping I can save you some time um, from my experience fine-tuning that, um, and you can skip uh, some of the places where I started. So when I first started, I was working in a corporate environment, uh, Windows machine, IIS kind of came as part and parcel of that. Uh, and so I had a Windows machine, I had Microsoft SQL in the back end of that, um, but I was kind of teaching myself programming and there wasn't that much about Microsoft stuff that was open source or easy to, to get to, so I was learning PHP. And I don't know if you've ever tried, particularly this is like, you know, the mid 90s, using PHP with IIS is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, so, I eventually moved to WAMP, which is kind of uh, a little application you can grab online and that sets you up where you have Windows, Apache, MySQL and PHP. Um, it's a little bit more common um, and it was uh, a lot better to use than just trying to use IIS, which doesn't work with HT access files or it didn't at the time and, and things like that. Um, but I had issues with case sensitivity on my files and permissions uh, not being the same between Unix environments that I was deploying to and my development environment on a Windows machine. So I tried to see if I could use a Linux box as my primary desktop machine for a while, probably too long, because that it's actually frustrating, maddeningly frustrating. There's just it's just doesn't have the polish of some of the other other uh, operating systems that you could use. So uh, I thought, yay, my d production environment and my development environment are basically the same thing right now. This is really good, except you know everything I want to do in my day-to-day -day job other than development was a nightmare. Um, so then I built my first Mac and uh, moved to MAMP, which, you know, like WAMP, it's Mac, Apache, MySQL, PHP. That was the sort of development stack there. It's it's the best of both worlds. You've got a nice desktop to use for your day-to-day -day stuff, but it's quite similar to a Linux environment. And so, you know, you don't have those case sensitivity issues and permissions issues and things like that transferring between environments. So that's fine. But then you end up with a lot of stuff installed on your Mac that you don't need all of the time. And I don't know if you ever wanted to play a game or something like that on your primary machine and then you realize that you've actually got Apache and MySQL and your websites, all the different projects you're potentially working on are all just running there in the background while you're trying to do other intensive things using resources. So then I switched to, uh, to VMs. Then you're running a virtual machine on your desktop. So you have your running Mac OS on your desktop computer, and then you have a virtual machine that's running Linux or whatever it is, and it can, it can be basically exactly representative of your production environment. So there's no, there's less of a worry when it comes to that Friday go live deadline that you promised you would never do to yourself again, but you do every time. And you're like, oh no, if I deploy this, it's Friday afternoon, uh, I know there's going to be those little differences between my development environment and my production environment, and things are going to go south. So VM allows you to sort of mirror that as exactly as you like, um, which gets rid of some of those headaches. So some of the options for VMs. Uh, you can, I, I've sort of highlighted four here, but there are, uh, there are others, and so I mentioned what they are as well. But you can go vanilla, where every project uh, you build your own, or maybe you, uh, you just have one VM for all of your projects. Um, but over time, you get, you know, different software that you've installed on your VM that's no longer relevant for your 30th project as it was for your second one. Um, if you do it per, on a per project basis, maybe you end up with five different VMs and they've all got slightly different systems and that 
the beauty of having your development environment and your production environment the same is gone because you no longer are, you know, you're having to switch between VMs all the time, etc. Um, so that's the problem with the, the vanilla one. There's a system called VVV, which is, you, you can jump on GitHub and look for VVV, and that stands for Varying Vagrant Vagrants. And uh, the idea there, it's quite a popular one. It's one big VM for all of your projects, generally is how that's used, and so you end up with uh, a whole lot of WordPress installs. Um, also, if you're doing development for WordPress core itself, it's set up for that. Um, that's fine um, if, you want to, if you want to go that way, but we'll, We'll get to why I prefer not to keep my things on, on one system in a minute. Uh, Bedrock is another one that's out there. Uh, it's probably not quite as popular, but it's, it's a really quite strong professional approach. It's a bit more complex, but they have a really good deployment set up using Capistrano and Ansible and things like that, if you've heard of those. Um, so that's quite a, a nice other one. Uh, the one I've settled on that I like uh, the most for just general development of client projects or of themes or of plugins or for WordPress core is, is called Chassis. It's really simple to set up and it's per project virtual machines. And you, you might think, why would I want to have a whole new virtual machine for every project that I use? And uh, the, my, my preference for this is because that way I can, if I do need any extra server software for a particular project, I can add it to that project without it affecting other projects. Um, over the life of your career, you're going to have more than one project that you don't still work on. So maybe you've worked on 30 projects over the last three years, but you don't need all of those to be up and running all the time, ready to go. And with VVV, for example, that's kind of how <coughs> you'll end up. You just Your VM gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more, you, the more projects you put on it. And there's just no need for that. It's overhead you don't need for each project. Um, so the beauty of using a virtualized system with VirtualBox and Vagrant and those kinds of things is you can spin up a virtual machine for a project. When you finish working on that project, maybe it's not permanently, but you've, you, know, you're not, you know you're not going to touch it for three months or so, you can destroy it and it will get rid of the entire virtual machine off of your computer. And you get those resources back and that space back and that even that mental space back. And when you go come back to it you know, later in three or four months, you can spin it back up and it's exactly as it was. So what exactly are these tools that I've kind of been mentioning as part of the virtualization process? What do you actually need to run chassis if you're not already doing virtualized development environments? Uh, so first of all, I recommend that you uh, version control all of the things. I use Git. In particular, um, a lot of us do. I hope you do. Uh, SVN is nice and everything, but uh, okay, I'm lying. It's not nice at all. Git's much better. Um, this is this allows you to version control um, your so you can version, version control your development environment itself um, by having your configuration files for your virtual machines under version control. You can version control your projects. You can version control your plugins within those projects. Um, all of that kind of stuff. If you're not already doing version control, that is definitely step one. Uh, chassis is your environment. Well, this is where you'll be doing all of it. This is the, the virtualized place that you'll be developing for your, your project. And I use uh, a nice, simple, fast mechanism for deployment um, tasks called, I'm going to call it Miner. You might call it Mina. That's your prerogative. I don't know how to. I don't know if, it's the, if, there's, a, if there's a preferred pronunciation, but this is a nice uh, way to to handle deployment. It lets you do uh, tasks that are common, fairly simple, uh, and related to moving information between your development environment and your production environment and back again. Um, so inside chassis, you have VirtualBox, or you can use VMware, and that's the software that runs the virtual machine on your machine. Um, Vagrant, which allows essentially allows you to version control that. So you have uh, machine specifications in a file. So you can say, I want this machine to have 512 mega RAM all the time. I want it to be maybe 6 gig of space. Uh, I want it to share these particular directories between the virtual machine and my machine, uh, and those kinds of things. 
And so that way, when, if you can completely destroy the virtual machine, and then you just say Vagrant up, and it goes boop, and there it is again, which is pretty cool. Um, so chassis is essentially um, a pre-built system for this. It's, it's just a GitHub repo you get to check out, and it has a Vagrant file in it already for that kind of specification, has it all set up ready to go for WordPress development in particular. Um, so, how does uh, Chassis work? Well, it handles the networking, makes it nice and simple, so you don't have to play around host files, you don't have to work on, you know, you want my project dot local, and then, you know, what IP address does that have, and how, do I need to go edit my host file and add IP address, domain name, etc. It uses Bonjour to just do that part for you, so you don't need to mess about in there. It has provisioning, so when you Vagrant up, which is how you launch a new virtual machine under Vagrant, uh, it deals with all the stuff that happens after the machine is running to get it set up to, in a way that you'll be able to use it. So this is what goes through and installs Nginx installs MySQL, installs the various server software that you need so that your environment is the same every single time. Uh, it does deals with the WordPress configuration, so that includes things like where the content directory is going to be, having a local config file that's, that's ready to override settings when it's on your local machine, but you can deploy the config file to your production environment and it's right for there, so you have those two different configs without getting in the way of each other. And it's very readily extendable. So it doesn't come with some of the extra things that you may or may not need for projects, like PHP My Admin, you might not need that for every project. Uh, Memcache, you may not need that on every project. Um, Mailcatcher, Tester for like PHP unit and things like that. Those are extra extensions so that when you do need them, they're quite easy to add um, where they're part of your environment, but not part of your project itself. Um, even for theme reviews. So if you do theme reviews and things for WordPress.org, uh, you can download Chassis, download the theme review extension, and then it gets everything set up for you, ready to go. So, getting set up. I've, I've mentioned a lot of words, a lot of uh, things you may or may not be familiar with already. So now I'm going to take you through, actually, how do, you, how do you do this? What does it look like? Is it very complicated? It's a little bit complicated. If you're, if you're comfortable with the terminal, most of my sort of uh, most of my explanation is going to be commands on the terminal. I'll go through each command and explain what it does. Uh, you can do these things through graphical user interfaces, but you have to switch between like three, four different applications, and for me that's more confusing than being able to explain to you what a command is and which command to use. Um, and I think getting comfortable with the terminal uh, is, you know, it's something that's going to help you anyway, particularly if you end up uh, like I did one time having to uh, troubleshoot for your client from the airport on your phone um, and I literally just had to log in to the server with the terminal on my phone and edit code live on the website. I don't recommend doing that but I was able to uh, and it got out of a tight spot. So, um, Okay, so when you, uh, when you download Chassis, these are the sort of main parts you'll have in the Chassis directory. Um, there's extensions live in there. Puppet is where all the provisioning happens for the VM. And WP is where WordPress lives. And then you have a content directory that you create. And this is where your project lives. So you don't need to edit any of the rest of it, really. You treat the content directory like WP content. And this is where you put themes and plugins um, as that your project needs. So you don't need to have the entire WordPress code base in your project's repo. Like, it's just kind of redundant information um, and it means you don't need to, um, you can keep your WordPress deployment separate from your project deployment because they are separate things. Uh, so I'm not actually going to do a dance and I'm also not actually going to do a live demo either. I decided to, to, uh, that a live demo might be crazy and so instead I kind of have screenshots to go through um, and, and I'm so glad I did because I, I botched this first time through when I was testing it. So. This is, uh, this is exactly the process that you can go through to get a project up and running using Chassis. Um, so this, imagine you don't have a development environment at all, 
We're going to get a development environment up and going, your project up and going, and then I'm going to show you migrating it. And I actually did this with a client site um, as pre preparation for this. So I know that it works. Um, so you fire up your, your command line. And I keep all my projects in a projects directory. So you may have, you know, by the end of your career, you'll, you may have thousands and thousands and thousands of happy customers. Uh, and you don't need to have all of them live at, at the same time. So you're going to bring up a new one. Let's say you clone chassis, git clone. If you're not familiar with, with git, git clone is, is the checkout process for version control. Um, and this is chassis repository. So if you go to github.com, um, this is slightly forked from chassis, um, but I'm hoping to get, uh, that's this purely for the deployment script stuff. Um, which I'm hoping to get back into chassis itself pretty soon. Um, so at the moment, there's my fork, which is github.com slash j slash chassis. And I'm going to clone that into my client directory, which is walk. Um, and I do a recursive clone. So this way, in this, in this sort of method, you can have, uh, if you don't already know what submodules are in Git, submodules mean you can it make, means you can make things a, bit, a little bit more reusable. Let's say you make a plugin for one of your clients, but you might also want to use it for another client. You put that in a repository by itself. And then for your client project, their actual website, you can just make that a sub-module. So by doing recursive, it'll check out all of those bits and pieces. Otherwise, you get your project without all the plugins. Um, not useful. So I've checked out that project, and you can see there every few lines it says cloning into, cloning into, and those are sub-modules. Um, separately maintained parts of chassis. Now change directory into the directory for your client project. And uh, I've set my terminal up so that I can see which branch <coughs> of Git I'm on. Uh, in this case, I'm on the master because I've just checked it out. So now I go to, if you, uh, depending where you host your client projects, I choose to host my client projects on Bitbucket because I can have as many free private repos as I like. Uh, on GitHub, private repos are uh, paid. And so if, you, if you're going to have a lot of them, that could get expensive. It's up to you, though. Um, so I've chosen to use Bitbucket for this. So I'm going to git clone my client project's content directory into the content directory within Chassis. Um, it tells me, warning, you appear to have cloned an empty repository. Well, that's totally fine because it's a brand new one and I do that on purpose. So once you've, got, once you've got that, part of setting chassis up, you copy your local config sample into local config and then you can go and um, make any project specific or environment specific uh, tweaks that you want to do. You know, if you want to, this turns on debugging, for example, but only for the local environment. So when you deploy your config to production, you don't have debugging turned on. And it can't happen because, you know, those files are separate. You're not going to accidentally turn on debugging on production. Um, the reason for the different file names there, one sample, that means that sample can be kept under version control. Local config can be ignored because you don't want to commit that into version control. Uh, you, there's also a config.yaml and config.local.yaml. And uh, these are config configurations. Um, so the last one, localconfig.php, is for WordPress. And the config.local.yaml is for chassis, um, particularly for the provisioning side of things. So if you go to edit that file, and I'll show you the main setting that you're going to want to change in there, and that is just adding in a host name. So I'm going to call it walk.local. By default, it'll be vagrant.local, but if you have 30 of them and they're all vagrant.local, that's going to cause you some headaches. Um, so, you know, it's quite easy to give them a name, and that's, you, you can see, it's quite well documented. You can see in the top there um, that you've got global and project specific uh, default configurations and project specific overrides for the local environment. Um, the reason for those and the difference between the project-specific defaults versus project-specific overrides is that at some point, Chassis, Chassis doesn't currently lay the provision to production um, within itself, um, but it will and those will allow it to 
deploy configs to production as well as keep the local ones separate. Uh, so we've saved those files and now we can do Vagrant Up. And what Vagrant Up is, does initially is it will go through and download a base image of a machine. So in this case it's uh, Ubuntu 12.04 um, LTS. Uh, there is a more recent LTS than that but uh, it, it can't use older versions of PHP. So that we're stuck on this one at the moment until we work out a solution for that for chassis. But, but that's quite fine. And that'll get you PHP versions from, I think it's like 5.2 five, five or 5.3 to 5.6, um, if, if you care about that. Uh, so the first time it'll actually download the base machine image, uh, and you'll have to wait a little while for that to happen, uh, depending on your connection. Uh, if you're on my current connection, you have to wait about half a day. Um, I'm getting NBN connected on Wednesday, so that'll be a lot quicker after that. Um, once it's finished downloading that, it'll go through and it only does that on the very first time. So it downloads that base machine image, which it's going to use for every other time you do it, um, up until we switch to 1404, and then you'll have to do it once more. But basically, it uses that base image for each new VM that you create for each new project. So you only have to wait a very long time initially. Uh, depending on your connection and after that it's something like three minutes and you have a new machine up and ready to go. It goes through and you can see the default URL, the uh, username and password that it has there and you're, you're ready to go basically and so now you can jump over to your browser and you're in. Lock.local slash WP slash WP admin or WP login .php, and this is up and running on your on your desktop or you can see this on your desktop. Um, so you can log in, WordPress is there. I've made it a nice small window. You can see the responsive layout. That's mostly for readability on these screens. Um, yeah, and you can see the front end of your default WordPress install. It's ready to go. So that's actually quite quick. Magic. <laughs> uh, now, once you've, once you've uh, got that up and running, and you, you might go and say, okay, I'm going to uh, import some stuff from the client project. Or you go and you build a client project. And this is where you put all the stuff into the content directory in your own repo specific for that project. And that's themes you need, plugins you need. Uh, you might import from SQL dump that you have elsewhere. So in, my, in this example, my client uh, already had a website. Um, as you, let's see, you'll see in a second. Uh, it's shitty and they're wanting to do a new one and so this is where I'm starting from. So they have an old website, I'm importing all the old content. Um, it's not very nice looking, it's not very responsive as you can see, um, but I'm ready to go now. So I have all the content in, I'm ready to go. So what does the flow look like after that? When you are ready to push this stuff up to production or you want to, just migrating data, code, etc. between environments. Um, so you have production, maybe you have staging, and you have local. Um, you might also have testing, or you might have testing instead of staging, or things like that. If you're not familiar already, staging is essentially somewhere you are putting it where it's publicly or maybe password protectedly accessible, but it's not the live site, so that your client can check it out. You don't want your client playing around on your development environment, so don't do that. Um, so you will want to sync, usually you will want to sync in this way, production down to staging, so that any um, sort of test changes that are happening are happening on as close to live data as possible without testing on the live site, because no one does that. Uh, and then staging down to local so that you're developing on as close to production data as possible. Um, then you'll want to be pushing up any local code changes back up to staging so that your client can verify, yes, that was the feature I requested and it works how I wanted it to the first time, nice work. Um, and then you push that on up to production. And it's on their live site and then you repeat the process again. You, know, you say, oh, I'm going to start working on this again. Um, look, for the, for the sake of consistency and no hair pulling, I'm going to pull everything back down from production to local before I start on the next new feature and then push it back up 
client approval, up to production, etc. And I deal with all of this with minor, I mean, however you say it. It's like uh, Capistrano, if you've heard of that, um, is a, a tool that does this kind of stuff as well. It's for, for deployment. Um, Capistrano, if you're going to be doing a lot of this stuff and it's going to be quite complex processes that you have for moving between environments, you probably want to go with Capistrano. Um, it, it uses separate SSH connections for each command that it runs, um, so that can be quite slow sometimes. Um, whereas Miner uh, is kind of a lighter, speedier version of this where it essentially compiles down each of those steps into one bash script. SSH connection, pushes it up, runs it, and that's done. So it's one connection. And usually the slow part of these things when you're connecting between servers is that connection between servers and the initial connection stuff. So Miner is good for keeping the time down on that stuff. It's nice and quick. Um, but because it queues, it does have the limitation of you can't do something locally um, or after you've done something on production, for example, because it queues everything up and then runs it on production. So as an example of something that doesn't work, uh, if you wanted to do a database dump on production and then you wanted to SCP it from local down, down to your local <coughs> machine, it's not going to work. They'll happen out of sequence. It'll try and SCP your database dump, which doesn't exist yet, and then it'll do the data, database dump and it's just sitting there. No one's copied it anywhere. So the, you can kind of hack around that and I've hacked around that for this setup. It's basically, I, let's not call it hacks, let's call them subtasks. Uh, so that you, you essentially do one task that does the dump and then you do another task that does the SCP and then you do another task um, that just runs those two. Uh, so that's kind of how I've got around that. So I've, do, I've got pull, pull uploads, pull DB um, and I have export DB and then I have a migrate and so migrate just runs those two in the correct sequence. So. Just to kind of demo this a little bit, it's not live and I'm also not dancing. Um, but we go to our project and there is a configuration directory, config. Uh, once you need to install Miner and once you have that, it looks by default in the config directory for a deploy.rb. And that deploy.rb is in my um, github.com slash jf slash chassis directory if you want to see it. Um, and then you have uh, a config file. So again, it's the sample thing. So you can copy config minor local sample to config minor local. And then go and edit that one and put in your, it has all the spots that you need to enter for your local and production environments as you have them set up for this project. So the host name, server name, and for example, uh, I'm going to be deploying this to wok.jf.com.au. Uh, that domain has that IP address. Uh, normally you could just do domain, but I ran into a situation where Cloudflare was getting in the way. Um, so I had to separate host name and domain. Um, domain is a built-in minor thing, so I couldn't change it to IP address, which would be more semantically correct. Um, but now I've explained it to you, so you're fine. Um, and then your dev is wok.local, home directory on the production server. Um, I've chopped off the comments for the sake of readability, but this file is commented so you can see what each of these things do. Um, and shared paths uploads, for example. So the way Miner works um, in terms of the, what it deploys to, it actually deploys up to five versions. It keeps up to five versions of, this is the same as Capistrano, but it keeps up to five versions of your project checked out on your production server. So that way, if you deploy and you go, oh, shit, I broke everything, uh, you can just do rollback. And what rollback does is it just goes and flicks a symlink between the latest version and, and the one before it. So it just flicks it back. It's like a really quick switch. It's no, it's no oh, no, I need to redeploy. It's just a quick, let's put that back for a moment uh, while I fix up that error. And then you deploy again, and it'll do the new one. Um, or like that kind of thing. And it keeps five of them there. So, you know, if you really messed it up, you're, you're covered. Um, so that's, that's why it has the, um, the, it also has shared paths. So uploads is shared across all of those five versions. So you don't have to wait for large files to copy between versions in deployment. It's literally just the code for your project that gets checked out. 
So finished editing that and then you can run the first task minus setup and that gets things ready to go. So that's where it creates um, public. So in this case public is your web route. Releases is where each of the deployed versions goes uh, up to five. Um, and then shared is where things like uploads go, where they're shared things. So um, public will have WordPress installed in there in, and you can install that however you like for your particular environment in this case. And then WP content is effectively symlinked to releases current. Um, and then uploads within that is symlinked to shares. So it's, it's kind of... It can be uh, just to take you a minute to kind of get your head around how that works, but it's actually quite nice, quite flexible, and makes things fast, and it, it kind of gives you that safety net of a really quick rollback if you really botch things um, without having to copy large files that you simply don't need your uploads in each version, right? That's, there's no point in doing that. It's a lot of space for no reason. Um, so once you've got that set up, you can do your first uh, minor deploy. And that will load any environment, things that it needs to uh, when it connects to the, the production server, creates a temporary path, then it will clone your code into the, um, into the place that it's, um, that it's going to be releasing it to. So you have the right branch cloned, then it removes any temporary caching and various things like that. It shows, you, it shows you the message there actually for your last comment. So I removed a temporary cache config file in my last comment commit before um, deploying. So you know, if, you, if you get to this point and you're like, wait a minute, that's not the commit I was expecting it to be, you know you can quickly do a rollback. Um, it'll also fail gracefully here too. If something errors out um, during that process, it won't symlink your public WP content to the current It'll just put everything back how it was before it rolls back. Um, so then it says build finished. So that's what the, the point at which it was successful. I have it flushing rewrite rules at this point as well. And moves the other uh, build for releases once. This is the very first one you've done. Um, that's launched. It's done. Um, and then I might say I wanted to um, move the database up because this is my first deploy. I'm not going to want to do this every time in this particular direction. But this is my first deploy, so I want to push the dev data up to production. So I can do minor migrate dev to production, and that'll actually go through and do a bunch of steps, including uh, replacing wok.local with wok.jake.com.au in the database, pushing that up, using WPCLI to do exports and imports of the data there as well. So it's nice, quick, robust um, serialization aware. So you kind of aren't going to accidentally mess with your plugin options and things like that. Um, and it doesn't take very long. You can see that took like a couple seconds, 10 seconds for the longest. So that 10 seconds is for the total of several steps, which took, you know, two, three seconds each. That's a pretty fast deployment process um, from dev to production with all your new code and stuff. Um, Push uploads, I do that as well. This is rsync. This, the, all, all, that, all that particular task does is rsync your uploads into the shared uploads, and they're, they're all up there. You basically only need to do this in this direction once, and then if you were to do a production one, you would do pull uploads if you wanted to get the images and stuff off the other one. That's not part of the migration task, because you may not always want to download you know, four gig of images from your client project into your local. Uh, and so then walk.jf.com.au now loaded like this. It's nice. I mean, admittedly, it's not a live demo, so maybe I got rid of any errors in between here. Taking screenshots, let's just say I didn't, and it was fine. So that's that whole process done. The site's live. Uh, it is literally live right now. So if you browse to that site, it's there, and I haven't done any more to it other than what I've shown you in these. So thanks for that. I'm Jafe. I work at Human Made. Uh, I appreciate you still sitting in your seats. And do you have any questions? <coughs> uh, you mentioned using Ubuntu 12 to get older versions of PHP. Is that a chassis requirement or something else to be able to use old PHP? Uh, it, it's essentially a WordPress requirement. So the idea is that we want chassis to um, be able to support all the version of PHP that WordPress can support. So that way, if you want to do any testing, 
uh, you can. And the oldest version that WordPress supports, I think it's like 5.2 something. Um, so if you can't do that on your machine, then you can't accurately test it. So that, that's the only reason. For me personally, I don't care that much about that older version. If someone goes, hey, there's an error in 5.2, I'd be like, hey, upgrade. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we've only got time for a few questions, so. If you're on a production server, like you don't have access to be able to deploy and do those exciting things like that, what is an alternative option? Sure. I, I wondered if someone would ask this, actually. So you do need to be able to SSH into your production server is the main sort of um, caveat, I guess, of this. But if you can't SSH into your production server, maybe you need to find a different host. Like, <laughs> you, I mean, you, well, yeah, or maybe some client education. Um, uh, for this example, I used an Amazon EC2 instance. Uh, it's <coughs> the T1 Micro, I think it is. That's like the smallest one you can get. In fact, if it's your first one, you have it free for a year. Like. Selling your client on free hosting for a year shouldn't be too difficult. Um, yeah, otherwise you can, you could write a minor task that would use FTP instead or something if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't envy you doing that, but you could. Any other questions? Cool, thank you very much. Oh. Find me later. <laughs>